What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you a special edition of Block Digest on Friday, April 24th. That took a second. Uh, we got uh, yeah. Marty Bent from Tales from the Crypt here. Uh, so, uh, so what's going on? Nothing much, man. Just very pumped to be here. Block Digest has been uh, in my rotation for quite some time. I feel honored to be uh, in the mumble recording with you freaks. Punks, excuse me. <laughs> I shamelessly stole that from you and just Freaky changed punks. it. Uh, I oh. de definitely riffed off of somebody else myself, so I don't own that at all. All right, real quick though, uh, before we really dive into it, because uh, these trolls in this chat box are going to have zero uh, self control. Uh, <laughs> can you go back in the the sound settings, Marty? and kill the the sound file column too or they're just going to intentionally make alert sounds because they're fucking assholes <laughs> yeah our chat they uh they tend to be a little bit you know in the discussion so yeah i guess that's one of those tick boxes we can tick off we could edit this out later there will be no editing just bitching about mumble's stupid default settings like come on who likes annoying sounds? Well, that's what I was saying. We got to, you were saying, we got to fork it. I mean, we got to make it to where it's like just much more special edition friendly. But I don't know. While, while Marty's doing that, uh, what's going on with you guys today, Rick and Janine? Uh, nothing. Just talking uh, earlier before how it does feel like spring has finally set in in this area. And uh, here in Colorado, we've got some showers and it's, uh, it's not snow. It's green grass is coming through and uh, things look like they seem to be bouncing back. So... Yeah, I am. I'm feeling the same way. I'm feeling good. I hope everyone's taken their uh, daily dose of bleach, you know. Or green tea. I'm drinking some hibiscus green tea. I mean, I know um, like, uh, yeah. Oh, you missed the joke. <laughs> Duh. What? 409. Yeah, you know, we, dude, we, we, dude, didn't you know that we got trial studies going right now? We want to inject the, uh, the, the, the kitchen cleaners and stuff and see if it helps with the virus. Oh my God. No, thank you. I've been like kind of in my, like I said, it's a, uh, it's beautiful weather out here and I've, uh, yeah, I've actually been kind of going against the grain of, uh, social distancing a little bit and I've been, uh, partnering up with someone and we've been going out and enjoying the crowds and everything. And yeah. I hadn't been paying much attention to what's been going on in the world of COVID. I imagine it's like, uh, it's two sides of like this. It's a crazy story, and uh, yeah, we're pretty late in this game. But yeah, I mean, we got Marty here to talk about it. I'm a big fan of Tales from the Crypt. I mean, like you know, Buck Digest and Tales from the Crypt. We kind of came up around the same time, and we were just like, I've always been a fan of what you guys are putting out too, and like we're in this crazy situation. So it's great to have you in the mumble, and we can talk about this world of COVID that we're in right now. And it's uh, it's kind of freaky out there like with surveillance and you know where do we stand with this virus and how exactly is business and economics going to shape up so it's going to be an interesting discussion it's really glad to have you here i'm very excited to be here again and i hope i just configured settings correctly can we get a trolley asshole uh to type in the chat while marty's mic is open open try it again ah! <laughs> Did I do it wrong? God damn it. All right. Um, if you go in the messages, the the right um, column under sound file, all of those. Delete them all. And seriously, I think the guys in here, like, you know, they're, uh, they're relatively nice on the troll box. So they'll enjoy the discussion. A little like asshole. Kind of just... yeah, yeah, we got the white hats here. This was a horrible idea. We should have just ditched the troll box when we ditched Hangout. All right. I finally found it. I think I did it correctly. All right, All right assholes. assholes. Uh, there we go. We're good. All right. So everybody's correct thinking today, right? No, no wrong think going on in, in this server. Right, guys? Wouldn't, have to, wouldn't want to have to report anything like that. We're, we are definitely keeping up and agreeing with all of the WHO guidelines, even as they change from day to day. I've got some bad thing in my mind right now. I might get in trouble if this leaks. I'm certainly, certainly wondering whether or not I've been, been 
Oh, is that so, wondering? What I no, I'm wondering whether or not I've been reported. Like I've been going out and uh spending time and enjoying Wink. somebody else's company and it's not really very socially distanced. So uh <laughs> I've been walking around and wondering whether or not because people are used to seeing me alone, so they're seeing me with someone else now and they're like, Oh, like that doesn't seem very socially distanced. But it's a relationship, so it's something else. I've like uh, I found someone, so that's pretty interesting. Announced here on Black Bad News. Yeah, I mean, this whole social distance thing is becoming more and more stupid to me by the day. Like where I'm at, I'm at, uh, down the shore. They shut down the beaches here, and it, like it's really pissing me off because it's a small island town, and there's not that many people on the island right now. It's usually a summer uh, vacation hotspot. So like it's already pretty, uh, pretty low population down here right now. Then they shut the beaches and like so if you want people to socially distance, uh, you shut down the beaches to reduce the total surface area from which people can socially distance. Like there's a lot of logical inconsistencies out there right now. Oh yeah, and it's it's starting to get like absolutely absurd. Like, you know, what? one thing that happened, um, this little Shinobi story, um, I have been drinking a lot during this. Let's just say that. And I've been going <laughs> out of my way to specifically get beer way later at night. Like, if I'm not getting it at the, the grocery store or something, like, I'm going to go late at night right before they stop selling booze because there's less people there. And our brilliant mayor in the city of Chicago decided to ban liquor sales after 9 p.m. So now if I'm making a beer specific trip, I have to go earlier when it's more crowded because that's that's the genius way to keep me separated from other people and safe from this virus. Yeah. yeah. I think, sorry, I was just going to say, I think the anxiety has got everybody kicking up the, the intake, intake of, of whatever, whatever the, the distraction is that's going to distract you from this situation where that's the thing, man. People are scared shitless right now. It's like, that's been the thing that's been most interesting to observe from my perspective. It's just like, wow. Like, we talk about like how politicians, corporations, and the powers that be leverage fear a lot. But now we're seeing it real time. And I, I mean, I was uh, 10 when 9 11 happened. Um, and so I wasn't really able to sort of be observant. I wasn't, I wasn't cognizant enough to be observant of, of the, the, use of leveraging fear to take away civil liberties. But now that I'm almost 30 and living through probably uh, the biggest event that's being used to leverage fear since 9-11, it is pretty stunning to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that's been like one of the major things too, where when we were going into this, I was kind of waiting for this moment really, where it is like people are kind of in a state of shock and they're kind of, either buying the story that this thing is incredibly toxic and, uh, or, well, you know, everybody's just analyzing this from their own perspective. And certain people have certainly bought into this, that this thing is going to kill me. And you, you know, you're at risk of me and like, it's a danger and, and there are real dangers out there, but we certainly have to understand the danger of economic, of losing economic viability within the world and understanding what that does to, to the country. Yeah. And, it's just, just a, a lot, lot of no, I completely agree. And I was I was one of those people in the beginning who was freaking out. Like and, and it's there's it's Matt and I talked about this yesterday. There's so much nuance that goes into all this. Like in the beginning you had you just had reports on Twitter of this virus spreading in China and you didn't you just saw videos of people getting welded into their apartments and people dying on the streets. And so initially I was like terrified, like, oh my God. Yeah, I was one of the people on not as loud as many others, but a couple of tweets were like, hey, maybe you should be taking this more seriously. But now I'm starting to lean towards uh, uh, maybe the the economic shutdown that we're, we're doing in reaction to this is going to have a far worse uh, effect than, than the virus itself. And uh, I think it makes sense to overreact in the beginning when there wasn't a lot of data and we truly didn't know what was going on. This is a new virus. Um, and so there is a lot of unknowns, but as the data comes in and we're finding that uh, more and more people are asymptomatic and the death rate may be severely lower than, than we anticipated, uh, it is makes sense to 
use that data to to make wiser decisions. Or I, I think you got to start letting pe- people go back to work, or you're going to see some crazy stuff happening. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I I kind of want to d- dive into like the the whole kind of nuance of what's going on there, and I, I definitely agree, like things need to open and you put the onus on the individual. But like, as far as the the statistics and everything and like, was this severe or not? Like there's a lot of shit. I think people are missing in the big picture, putting this all together. And it really is. I think just people need to stop seizing on numbers and painting a picture with that because like this is an RNA virus. So it mutates pretty quickly. Like it, there's, you don't have the error correction. Like it, it spreads fast, lots, lots of, little of little changes. changes. And when you look at a virus spreading, this is actually how the Ebola outbreak um, under Obama was snuffed out. It just naturally mutated to a less um, transmissible form um, and snuffed itself out. And like a virus is going to be most uh, likely to mutate in a less lethal direction because that's what helps it spread. And we've seen this spread globally now. And, and we just like how much care is being, you know, taken to look into like what strain is where, like how much does that account for the differences? Like, are we witnessing that process of it kind of mutating and less and less worse versions of it being the things that propagate widely? And then importantly, how does immunity for this actually work? Because coronaviruses do not typically give a lifelong immunity. They give an immunity that lasts weeks weeks to a year. year. So like, how does that, you know, all of those things, how, what picture does that really paint? How serious was this when it started in China? How serious is it now that it's spread and we've seen mutation take over? And most importantly, are we actually going to get long lasting immunities from those less serious versions that would protect us from a more serious strain if that's still circulating? Yeah, I mean, these are all answers I, <laughs> these are all questions I don't have the answer to. But yeah, no, it's, it does seem like there are multiple strain, uh, uh, strains, excuse me, going around and, and it's attacking different people differently. So that's one thing. Um, it's becoming more obvious. And I know you, you said don't die seize by the numbers, but the numbers are saying like if you have comorbidities, if you're older, um, if you're out of shape, uh, it's going to affect you more than the healthy people. No, again, it's, there's just so many unknowns that it's hard to make like ra- or it's hard to make decisions, let alone rational or good decisions. But I do in the last couple of weeks specifically, um, I've been like weighing the the externalities of shutting down the economy like what's what's going to hurt more people what's going to kill more people in the long run this virus or and or shutting down the economy having people stay at home not getting vitamin d getting depressed lowering their immune systems uh in that way because if you think of immunology as well uh we need to be sort of exposed to this stuff to, to develop a better immunity if we're just sanitized at home we're hurting our immune systems in the long run as well. Um, again, it goes back to nuance. And then if people lose, I mean, what is it, 26.5 million are unemployed right now? Like how long can that persist before people revolt? Like $1,200 of Trump bucks is not really going to hold people over. And at some point, push is going to come to shove and you're going to have some form of civil unrest. Um, and is it worth it at that point? And if you compare it to... The models that were forced on us and that really drove these decisions early on when they're calling for 25 million dead um, and then factoring in social distancing and quarantines that got dropped to a couple million and then it got dropped to a couple hundred thousand now here in america it's down to like sixty thousand. i think is the upper bound estimate of of how many will will uh, succumb to this virus and then and then you get into the whole discussion of like just labeling deaths that, that would be like if somebody died and they just happened to have COVID-19, like labeling that a death from COVID-19, like they died from something 
else but just so happen to have COVID-19. There's a bunch of data manipulation on it. And again, it fucking sucks because it's impossible to make good decisions when, when this type of data manipulation and bad statistics are out there. Yeah, but, you know, on that side, it's, you know, I get it. Like, if, if you have somebody die in a car crash and you test him and chalk that up to COVID, that's crazy. But, you know, we, we've seen so much indication that this is not just something that attacks the lungs. It can attack the heart, the, the testicles, the, the liver, the kidneys. There's actually been case studies that show this can pass the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain and cause encephalitis. So I think, like, you know, I, I definitely think you should be looking at the data skeptically to get the clearest picture, but I don't really see anybody looking at that for clarity. I see them screaming, like, all these numbers are bullshit because this is how it's being counted. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Um, but, like, how, like how, long, how long should we be scared of this disease? Like, uh... Like, are we ever going to go back to normal? Are we just going to be in our pods, like, uh, worried about this our whole lives? That's well, I mean. No, I think, like, in a year or two, like, worst case, it burns itself out to the, the least common denominator, something that is literally just a cold, and then we go on and we have a new thing that causes the flu. And, but, like, my thing is, like, we have to get the economy running. Like, that, that is not a question. That has to be done. I just don't want people to do that. And then this becomes nothing to worry about at all. Like they just forget that this actually is out there. This virus is real and that does present a risk. Like, yeah, we have to get the economy running again, but doing that does not require going, this virus isn't real. Oh, I don't think anybody's saying the virus isn't real. And I agree. You don't just want to throw people back into bars and music festivals and stuff like that and i matt said this last night too on, on rabbit hole recap like people are just going to be inherently scared to do that stuff off the bat too so it may just be this like natural uh social distancing that that occurs because of people are, are just afraid of that scenario that you just put forth and i want to mention another thing social distancing is a terrible orwellian term I'd like to get away from that and say like physically distancing, social distancing sort of has a connotation of like, don't even socialize with others. Just listen to what we're saying. Don't be social. Don't think. Um, that is that is one interesting Orwellian term that is being used right now. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of this Orwellian stuff going on that I'm really worried about. And I mean, like I'm like we're saying, you know, there's a lot of data to try and track to try and predict what you should be doing and how you should be moving about your business. But the economic side of things, they will right themselves. There is going to be some rough patches. Like we're already seeing that in places like Pennsylvania. There's been video footage of people just standing in front of the Capitol with masks on and guns. And at the same time, you know, this virus is now being directed as something from Wuhan and China and the South and warships have moved into the South China Sea. Contact tracing is being enabled and being told that it needs to scale up. And whenever I start thinking about how exactly is this going to change from where we are now to where we are in the future, when 9-11 happened, Marty, I was 18 and I'd already signed up for the Army and I noticed a big change in everybody's that adjustment to privacy and the way that they had to go about their business at the airport. And this could be a new normal, where now all of a sudden the new normal is whoever gets in trouble, maybe everybody that you've been in contact with with the past 14 days is also now in trouble. And the fact of the matter is that we're doing this because we're at war with China, and we have to compete with China on every level. Yeah, I mean, I watched or watched and listened to, it was on YouTube, a very interesting podcast, uh, Whitney Webb on a comedian Timothy Dillon's podcast talk mainly about the Jeffrey Epstein case and the fallout from that. But towards the end, they talk about uh, the document of freedom of inf- a document that was attained via a FOIA act that basically highlighted the fact that the U S government wants to surpass China's mm-hmm. ability to track its citizens and sort of control. They, they sort of want, the digital panopticon that China has to be exported here and they want to do it better because they think that is imperative to maintain global uh, hegemony into perpetuity. So, I mean, 
if there was ever a crisis to take advantage of to sort of implement these policies. Is that, I mean, the fear of the unknown, again, going back to fear, like people just, when they're scared, they fucking like, say, help me, help me, help me, and we usually turn to the government. And I think, I think we're being taken advantage of in a lot of regards in terms of civil liberties right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, look at Congress right now. Um, the Earn It Act, trying to ban end-to-end -end encryption. The pushes for this contact tracing right now. Like, I don't know if you've heard about the Kids Act. Um, it's another thing being pushed uh, separate from the Earn It Act that wants to do crazy shit like ban upvote and like buttons um, and, and paid um, promotions in any kind of platform like YouTube. Um, to pretty much force um, all of these platforms, platforms to stop any kind of social interaction or ranking i have not heard of that act, and that sounds fucking terrible and that's i mean that's I, I talk about this a lot we're at this weird inflection point of human history we have two roads we go down we either get the digital panopticon exported from china to the rest of the world or we stand up and, and go the other direction and in the midst of all this stuff it's hard to see uh us going in the other or at least the government in regulators leading us in the other direction like we do genuinely need a grassroots movement of people to start speaking up defending civil liberty i think that's one thing that people really discount is just like literally talking about it writing about it uh, going on podcast about it like stand up for civil liberties and freedom and digital age because they're they're trying to take all of that shit from us right now and they're they're using this virus hysteria to leverage our fear to do it and it's, it's happening like the cares act they got that cdc the mandate that the cdc has to build that contact tracing app like it's here like are we going to just put up with it mm -hmm. and i love the way you put exporting from china, china in there, there. Um, um yeah that that's quite literally happening right now the like the china is kind of doing this this thing where they're looking at the economic imperialism America pulled off over the last 70 years and they're copying it. And they, they did this in Europe where they went around oh, wow. to all the municipal governments on coastal regions and just directly invested money to help build port infrastructure at the municipal level. They're doing that right now in the United States, going to municipal county level police departments and giving them surveillance drones to just monitor people for social distancing. Like that shit is not sending everything it sees back to some fucking server in China. Like the, 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 the necessity to work remotely to teleconference for like everything, like just normal social interactions, major institutions, education, like fucking people who work for major banks and financial firms have to do that. The government has to do that. All of that is now open for digital espionage in this situation. Like th this is literally just snap. And everything that was behind closed doors before is now exposed. Yeah. And it, what's even worse, it's being completely normalized. Like people are like cheering it on in some aspects. Like you, I, not, this is an example of people cheering it on, but something that scared the shit out of me is in Australia, just in the video of like the infrared drone caught three dudes on a roof, just having beers and like forced them to go down and get a ticket. Like it is minority report. Like I've I tweeted it out a couple times this year. Like minority report is, is coming. Uh, not the show, the movie. Yeah. I mean, we are living in this or well, well, it's this t moment where I think what we're talking about with Corona has really kind of split up this what governance structures work and how supply chains work and economies of scale operate and we're really about to see a big shakeup in that and we've talked on the show several times about how you know these currencies are going to redraw maps their money is jurisdictional and china said last year before all this stuff that they were going to seize the blockchain initiative i mean there was a three thousand dollar green candle on october 25th that was from that statement and I mean, like you look at what's going on in Taiwan, South China Sea and North Korea and Kim Jong Un just just all of a sudden went down. And what's going on here is like we, we are in a, a Cold War with China and we're trying to avoid a hot war. And at the same time, everybody's freaking out about their ability to negate this virus. It is it is really freaky and people are scared. And, you know, 
back in 2001, Marty, again, like, you know, I, I was, you know, people, uh, I, I signed up for the military before all that stuff in September 11th. And like, you know, it really hit me hard to see the way our rights got eroded so harshly after September 11th. And you know what? This time we do have Bitcoin. We do have grassroots abilities to enable these networks to really grow organically from the ground up and create real supply chains from regional markets that create goods that are needed across the country. And we can do this, but it is like a new world. It's a new world of people that are using like podcasts and meetups and and Bitcoin and markets that are censored and people that have shared interest. And it, it's we're in this new world, but we have the tools to come together and really try and build out some uh, some levels of freedom that we might not have had before. Uh, yeah, before all this, as far as like uh, the country goes, I mean, it's it's one of those dreams that I have as far as looking at this. I've been here in Boulder, Colorado, running this meetup for, you know, two years plus now. And uh, just recently got onto the cannabis licensing and advisory board. And I'm looking at Bitcoin as a settlement mechanism for cannabis here because, I mean, that just makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And I mean, like what you guys are doing with the uh, Great American Mining, I mean, that also makes perfect sense. And, you know, if we could just like, you know, make sure that these networks are actually building like real, you know, next generation exchanges that are onboarding people the right way with proper custodial services and showing them the way that they could do financial privacy with coin joins. And we could take the risk. We could stomach that risk. Like, and, and we can do this, but it is going to take us to like stand up. No, I completely agree. And I want to say a couple things to that point. Like, one thing that really drove me towards Bitcoin and sort of speaking up about protecting civil liberties was a conversation I had uh, with my boss when I was still working in finance at a fund. He he grew up and was raised in Soviet Russia and he immigrated to the U.S. in 1994. And I'll never forget, like one day we were just having a, I've said, I've told this story on Tales from the Crypt a couple of times, but for the punks out there who haven't heard it, like one day we were sitting down at a portfolio meeting, just shooting the shit. I was just being like a little annoying 22 year old asking him questions about uh, Russia and civil liberties and stuff like that. And he looked me in the eyes. He was like, Marty, like ever since 9-11, when I first immigrated here in 94, like I'll never forget the amount of freedom I felt when I walked to the airport for the first time, just like not being tracked, not having any eyes on me, just being able to walk freely through an airport. Like I cried because I never experienced that, that feeling of freedom before. And he was like, the U.S. is turning into the Soviet Russia I ran away from since 9-11. And like what's going on with the TSA and airports particularly, like we are slowly uh, descending into into a a Soviet Russia like uh, sort of dystopia where you are being watched, you're being controlled, you're being told what to do. Yeah, yeah, you know, it really upsets me as somebody where it's like I I felt that too because I spent I spent 18 years before September 11 growing up in rural Louisiana. And I felt a real sense of freedom on a lot of levels when I was a kid. And I know that kids growing up and like, you know, people of your generation and even more so kids of the next generation where it's just not there. And like, uh, you know, maybe Bitcoin and a right alignment incentives and showing that there's a proper, you know, uh, network there that can keep everything moving in the right direction. We can create the incentive structure to build out secure hardware and more privacy enabled features that try to keep people's private keys secure. Yeah, exactly. And what we have to realize too, is that there's so many more of us than there are like the people who are enacting these policies. They make up a very, very small percentage of the world. Like we talk about China versus the U S and a race to create a better panopticon. Like the people actually racing to do that are a very few number of human beings out of 8 billion on earth. Like, I think we need, like, everybody talks about like a, a great awakening that we're going through right now with uh, social media, allowing people to communicate and stuff like that. Like, I think that's the number one thing people need to realize that there's a very, 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 very small percentage of people making these massive decisions on behalf of the billions of the rest of us. And, uh, people fear these governments and these institutions, but at the end of the day, they're made up of a very small number of people. 
Uh, speaking of people who are uh, frequently tracked and told what to do all the time, I'm I've been paying attention to this stuff about uh, calls for banning on homeschooling and the statements from I don't remember his name, but some professor or lecturer at Harvard saying that you know the the relationship between child and parent is defined by the state or the state the state um as an authority supersedes that and like i made the decision when i was even still in school myself that i wasn't going to i wasn't going to have my kids educated in public schools not only because i feel like the social situation there is completely the opposite of what I think kids need. I did actually a lot of research on this when I was in school about like, what is the best way for children to learn? And I found that children learn best when they're in mixed age groups. That means younger kids and also older kids. And basically uh, a lot of the traditional educational system is based on the idea that if you're the same age, you should be learning such and such as everyone else your that is also your age and then you you know go up at the same time as them which makes no sense if you look at educational literature and the other thing uh that uh i found is that kids don't learn well when they're constantly being told what they should learn they should have some freedom to decide what they want to focus on and of course there's you know some fundamental things that should probably be part of their education at an early stage, but at the end of the day, they should be able to decide. And anyone who's been to a public school, at least in a lot of Western European countries and the United States and Canada, and probably lots of other places, um, that's not that's not how things are set up. There's, I mean, I was actually in a program that um, mostly due to the fact that there was a. Uh, there was a gap in the training that was required to teach the course and the training that a lot of the teachers had. I was able to be in like a program that was self-directed in practice because uh, a lot of them didn't know what to do. And so I, I was very early on teaching myself and not really being instructed or directed. And that was probably the most influential period for me or the period that I felt the most free and so these people who are saying who are afraid now that because children have been forced to be at home and um can't can't go outside let alone go to school um but they're discovering you know lots of uh, problems with the educational system not only in the fact that the, the a lot of parents are finally seeing what kind of material their children are being given and a lot of it is distorted and wrong um like now they're scared that a lot of people you know even if they don't have the uh financial uh support to be able to do so they are curious about you know what would happen if we kept on doing this and so they're trying to reassert that dominance even while they're even while the schools are closed, which is very scary. No, and I, I have the names of the professors uh, from Harvard because uh, because I wrote a piece about this on the bent on Tuesday. It's uh, James Dwyer and Elizabeth Bartholet. Um, yeah, and they're pushing the, to to ban homeschooling. And Jenny, I really like what you just said there about like kids work best in. Uh, mixed age groups and when they're sort of uh, learning about things that they're interested in. I think another reason why I am the way I am is I was lucky enough to have my, my parents send me to a Montessori school for a few years when I was young, I think between the ages of like six and eight. And I think that's had a very profound impact on my life overall going forward because that's what the Montessori sort of structure is you mix age groups and you, you sort of see what kids are interested in and push them in that direction. And then from there went to Catholic school and then we moved to South Carolina for a bit and started my public school journey. And then, uh, from, I think, uh, third to eighth grade, I went to public school and absolutely hated it. Like having to walk 
and even Catholic school too, having to walk in line in the class, uh, just being put in this eight period a day, monotonous structure. Uh, it's just not the way humans are supposed to learn. And then I tend not to, I tend to uh, do Occam's razor with most things, like don't attribute malice to what is just uh, uh, stupid decisions. But these days, specifically with public schooling, it's like hard to not think that the powers that be are trying to make people stupid and control them. Like Common Core, I'm, I'm, my, I, I'm a relatively new father. I have a son who's two months old. Obviously, he hasn't gone to school or anything yet, but I've started thinking about like, all right, if he does go to school, uh, I'm considering homeschooling, actually, or unschooling, um, which I talked about Liberty, my, Mike Krieger from Liberty Blitz Creek. I highly recommend you go check the end of that episode of TFTC with him where we talk about unschooling, which is uh, sort of si very similar to the Montessori way. Um, but um, where does it go with this? Uh, uh, the, yeah, like Common Core Math. Like I'm trying to prep myself for my kid. He's years out from doing this, but... I talk to parents who have kids in second, third grade. They can't even do their homework with their kids because they're teaching math in such an indirect way. Like you, 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 they're forming the curriculum in a way that like their parents can't even help. And so the students are wholly dependent on the teachers and the state that directs those teachers to teach them a critical uh, sort of skill that you need to learn in life, which is math. Yeah, it's a forced dependence. But a uh, random anecdotal question, Marty, as somebody who shares the uh, Catholic to public school jump, um, was it also your experience that when you started at the public school, you, you had a class or two and then looked around and went, why are you teaching everybody the things I learned like two or three years ago? Yeah, yeah. And I actually wound up going back to Catholic school for high school because of that, um, where I was just like bored in class. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, it, it was, I, and I actually had the benefit. I went to Catholic school and, uh, actually went to a Quaker school for a year too, a friend school. And the friend school was actually even better than the, the Catholic school. But yeah, the public school system is, it's fucking stupid, man. Like the, 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 the standardized testing you have to take, the, the, they sort of dumb everything down uh, from my experience at least there's obviously good public schools out there but i think as a whole it's pretty pretty daft no oh, so atrocious in louisiana that i think it just uh, yeah i think it became the game to figure out how to get through school without doing school and like it, i learned a lot about game theory and how to like work around the edges and you know getting through the public school system but i just want to shout out real quick congratulations on the two month old holy cow Great job, Marty. Like uh, that's great, man. Good, Good job. job. Yeah, thank you. It's been uh, it's been incredible. He's he uh, he was born at a very interesting time. So I'll have stories to tell him about uh, his his birth in early 2020 and what was going on. But uh, luckily, we got out of New York and we're we're in the small village by the sea, so we don't have that added stress on top of everything, and we have plenty of access to food. And, and other essentials that we're just able to focus on on making sure he's happy I, th I think you said that wrong marty i think what you meant to say was your son will have things to roll his eyes at and not listen to because they make no sense to him <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's another thing i think like i mean i i've never really been a city person but i've you know been willing to explore and tolerate it for a number of years but after this, like there is, I can't see myself living long term in a city, not just because like I, I already had issues with living in a city before this, but this just makes it unbearable. Um, so yeah, that's, that's another thing is because uh, it's kind of been scattered, but there's been some places um, even in the US, like whole states have banned or tried to ban the sale of seeds and other things they consider, quote, non essential, which is bizarre to me because if you were thinking practically about it, okay. having people, what? I'll explain that. It's this simple. If everybody starts growing vegetables in their garden and does that, then the consumer market for vegetables farmers are growing is going to get kicked in the dick even harder. 
Well, yes, I was I was getting to that point. Um, oh, sorry. But but I was saying Damn, like, she... from. <laughs> sorry, from... I started drinking. I'm sorry. You you started. Okay. Are you sure you just started? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Anyway, so from a if you were looking at this from a rational perspective, you would say if I want to keep if you know I'm the central I'm the central planner and I want to keep people safe. Um, what is the best way, to, like one of the, you know, transmission hubs, transmission areas is obviously grocery stores. That's like, unless people have actually stocked up enough food, which most people haven't, they're going to be visiting the grocery store twice, if not once a week, um, on average. And that means they're going to be interacting with people and possibly, you know, transmitting it on the food that other people are buying or to other people. So how do you... You know how can you eliminate that risk as much as possible well you can allow people to grow their own food so they don't have to rely on the grocery store and that would also put less <laughs> less strain on the supply chain because you know they keep complaining that people are you know buying too much and there's not enough for everyone well how about let people grow their own food it would be rational but yeah so you mentioned the fact that i mean oh god the far the farming industry in the u.s is so is so fucked up because something like that so people growing their own food shouldn't be a threat but it is because you have these giant industries that are already like they're already being subsidized by the government especially certain crops and so they're already not operating at any reasonable level of efficiency um and also you know it also elim because you have these large industrial farms instead of local farmers markets you're eliminating that too again it's just like it's not rational it's not protecting people to say you shouldn't be buying you know seeds or gardening stuff or whatever that is what people should be doing but they don't want to do it because it's going to just poke more holes in this system that the government wants to keep running even though it's clearly not going to work and more people are going to die you know what the real irony is? That all of those subsidies exist um, for national security reasons under the logic that we need to make sure that we have food when we need it. Well, I would push back there. Like the corn subsidy, subsidy particularly is like, again, like that's where like it's beginning to question Occam's razor is, is the corn subsidy is there for like, ethanol and corn syrup production, which are proved to be bad for health and ethanol is fucking a waste of economic energy yeah but a, g a good amount of farming subsidies are put there for national security reasons and that is absolutely if you like to have autistic fun and read through random dod documents sometimes um like a major part of their long-term like thinking in those regards is like if the world tries to kill america do we have food? Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, the a lot of farms right now they're talking about, um, like I saw something about how pork pork uh, pig farmers are killing the animals. Like they're at the point where it's it makes sense to them to literally just kill animals and not use them for any purpose, just kill them and put them in mass mass graves. Like it at some <laughs> like. <laughs> what you can't you can't like kill them and keep the meat for yourself so that you're sustained so that your neighbors are sustained is there really such a low demand in your area and if there is then that means you have that means that the main problem is distribution okay if you can't have distribution then people need to start thinking about growing on their own property because if stuff isn't moving around it's there but it's not moving then how like the subsidies aren't going to fix that like they're at that point you have to have people growing food there's no other answer yeah it's been like one of the crazy things to come to realization of during this lockdown is the different supply chains the food supply chains in america particularly like you have the restaurant food supply chain and then the grocery store food supply chain and it seems that they do not interact with each other at all like the restaurant uh, industry supply chain has had like you said either killing hogs or just like letting vegetables and produce just go to waste dumping it i saw idaho 
It has like mounds and mounds of potatoes that just have not been sold to restaurants. And it's been infinitely fascinating just to observe the inability for the restaurant food supply chain to sort of shift towards the grocery store. Maybe it hasn't needed to, but it, like there has to be a way to get those goods to the end consumer at the end of the day. Like they haven't been able to pivot throughout all this, which has just been interesting to see. Well, it's, it's part red tape and part logistics. You know what I mean? Like one, the approval to change things to do that. And then two, like food package producers aren't, they they don't take that group of food into account. You know what I mean? Also, has anyone else um, experienced yet? Uh, We've had so uh, one of the toilet rolls that we got recently. um, It doesn't have the cardboard roll in the middle. Has anyone gotten any special rolls like that? What? I I got some toilet. We have some toilet paper that we got recently, and it doesn't have the little cardboard uh, cylinder in it in the middle. What? I haven't experienced that yet. But that's pretty crazy. I haven't experienced that yet either. But I have experienced like uh, there's like a grocery store where there was like a week there where the only toilet paper in town was like single ply. But I mean, like uh, that's kind of the weird supply chain kinks we're going to see in manufacturing where i think like all of these subsidies and it's try to encourage like the macroeconomic market where what we're talking about where it comes to you know unschooling and on homeschooling and trying to build out farms is we're trying to build out these like robust uh you know micro not micro economies but just like uh you know regional markets and markets that supply regional goods and i mean that's where i think about Colorado and the cannabis market. And I mean, like somebody that uses cannabis as medicine has been doing so for over five years now. I just really see it as like something that we can like as far as an an industry that's ripe for change and that needs it right now in this moment is like traditional medicine. If there's a way that we could create sports injury clinics or clinics that are specifically tied to ways that we can, you know, fix these problems easily with uh, cannabis and, you know, cannabis derivatives to make a medicine that can help people with where they don't have to go to hospitals that they could potentially be around affected people or anything like that. And I mean, we can try and grow that out and scale it out and uh, try and export that good to the rest of the nation. But it is like, uh, it's a lot of work and you know, it's like each, each area I think has its own sort of regional good and we could kind of interconnect that. Like, I mean, like I would like to get together with the Texas Bitcoiners down there and we can make like a cannabis uh, beef trade, you know? Yeah, that would be incredible. That's uh, that's one thing I've actually been I've been trying to support like lo- like smaller ranchers throughout all this. Uh, I don't have a really good butcher where I am, so I've been finding uh, small small ranchers uh, on the internet and buying beef directly from them. And I, that's actually probably a positive externality that that is coming out of all this is the support of those smaller local businesses. Cause there's like this weird thing too, where like the Tyson's, the Smithfields, they're having like outbreaks in their slaughterhouses. I don't know if it's, um, I don't know why that is if it's spreading via the animals or the, the demographic of the workers in those, uh, slaughterhouses uh, are more susceptible to COVID-19, but it's that's been an interesting phenomenon that hasn't been very well explained. Well, <laughs> let's move on from the potential tinfoil there. But, what? Like, what is that tinfoil? No, I, I was <clears throat> intentional infection. Um, but let's just say um, that... You, you think so? I, I'm, just, I'm just drunk shinobi thoughts but um like the the whole notion though of of localizing everything like that rick is on fucking point like that is a distributed like production model in markets that is just way more fucking robust against everything and it's when you when you really have something like this situation get people rethinking their their risk you know analysis or or opportunity cost analysis of different things in terms of well i can get that just a little cheaper you know that starts to look a lot more viable than just like the the middle class yoga moms buying organic everything and 
it's just so much more of a robust way to to operate a society is to have that localized production and distribution of the important things and let those those not so important things become the real mass scaled specialized thing we're used to handling everything in the world right now no i agree and i'll like loop this back to what janine was saying earlier about not living in a city like this whole thing has expedited my move out of new york city uh i have not officially moved out yet but i will not be uh, extending my lease there and I, I saw you put it in the chat you know but you'll have a farm of cattle that's one of my goals too um over here back east is to get some farmland and sort of get away from the city and really recalibrate the uh like how I'm living my life and like having lived in New York city for it's hard to believe fuck six, six years now, um, coming from Chicago, actually, uh, it doesn't, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Like I live in a fucking 750 square foot studio with my wife and now son and we're paying, I'm like paying an obscene amount of money for that. And it's and this, like now that we have a son in our lives, it's like the opportunity cost is, is too large not to move out of there. Mm -hmm. You can always drive into the city when you want to do degenerate city things. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I mean, and on top of that, like New York City has been getting sketchier and sketchier since I've lived there, at least in my opinion. I don't know if I'm just uh, over indexing for uh, looking for sketchier things or if it's actually sketchier, but to me, it seems like it's getting like. It feels like you have 11 million rats in a, in a very small cage, and they're they're starting to get really pissed off. I, I refer to it as a crypto Azkaban. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I only ever uh, got the, uh, the glimpse over the uh, Magical Crypto Conference weekend, but my, my uh, quick analysis was pretty much this is like Chicago, but with wider streets. Chicago's so much cleaner, though. Like just simply because of the fact that it has back alleys and you put all your trash on the fucking street. Forgot the garbage everywhere. Yeah, that was kind of weird, but I just like wrote that off in the back of my mind pretty quickly as like, uh, I'm drunk, don't care. Yeah, and people in Chicago are much more down to earth. Like I prefer Midwestern. It's, I mean, I'm from the Northeast. Like uh, I like there's beneficial aspects of the hustle and bustle and grind and sort of cutthroat nature of the Northeast, but I really, really appreciated uh, the Midwestern lifestyle when I was in Chicago for five years. You, you know, just that's... push a little bit further west and go to the Rocky Mountains, man, and check out this lifestyle. I'm, I'm telling you, it's something else out here, Mark. My sister's out there. I actually owe her a long visit, so I, I, I will be in the Rockies soon. You know, this is actually nice. close to a, a, an issue coming uh, up because of this uh, whole situation. Um, so is, is, has everybody been paying attention to what's going on with uh, the, the pandemic policy to see like these regional blocks? Yeah. yeah. I've seen the West Coast and the Northeast councils. That's about it. Um, let, me, let me pull this, this tweet up in my bookmarks real quick. Where was it? Um, yeah, I think there's there some Rocky Mountain more. Corridor. Yeah, okay. So right now, um, source disclosure random tweet and haven't looked deeper than that but um washington oregon Who's california in one thing in one like group um arizona utah new mexico and the navajo nation in another um pretty much north dakota south dakota nebraska iowa missouri and arkansas along the mississippi um one group the Midwest Partnership, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. And then you have Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, an area around um, like pretty much New York down to Delaware. Um, then the it's it's like th this is literally drawing like regional lines. And I mean, like this is just gonna get so fucking weird. Because like we all know that what happens now is going to set precedents and laws and things that will not go away. And there's going to be coordination in, across these whole regions on like what they're going to do in those regards. Like this literally is going to set like radical weird differences 
in laws and precedents in, in these different regions in this country. Yeah. And I, I mean, one thing I've learned throughout my life, I've had the, the benefit again of living in the Northeast, I lived down South in South Carolina and in the Midwest in Chicago. And people think vastly differently between those three regions alone. And then you, you get into the, the, the Rocky region, the West coast, the uh, Southwest, South, uh, like Texas, I would, consider texas a weird anomaly maybe texas and oklahoma can can be lumped together but people think very differently in, in different parts of the country and we're seeing it now so there's you know like the dakotas sort of being more lax with uh with like shutdowns and stuff like that for letting people work and the more liberal uh states are are, are being more authoritarian and shutting down you're going to have this i mean bitcoiners talk about it a lot the, the eventual balkanization of the world, the U.S. particularly is what we're talking about now. But if we do, I mean, it seems like things are beginning to fragment. And I know Cal Northern California, Oregon, and Washington have like been the, the one that's been most seriously considered in the past. But now you have, like you just described, at least four or five regions being seriously considered during these lockdowns. Yeah, and it's like all it takes is that synchronicity and how they're going to handle this situation to like, the, you know, this is how this works. This is how the back interests shape things, like slide stuff in, how the strings get pulled. The framework gets laid here and it stays there. Yeah. I mean, we, I, I, I go from like, is this the best time to be alive because of like all the opportunities that come from this or like, are we just like in the weird, like tumultuous era before like all the good stuff comes? It was the best it's of weird. times. It was the worst of times. Yeah. I mean like to breaking this up into blocks and just in this discussion and like, you know, I mean, this is where as, as somebody that was using cannabis as medicine in Louisiana, where it was illegal and you think about like Louisiana had kind of had like an authoritarian bent to it. And so does Texas, because it's a lot about their highway patrol. And, you know, that's the way a lot of these like little towns in Texas make a lot of money is people driving from one area to the other. And, you know, they write a bunch of tickets. And so that lobbies like law enforcement and rallies the crowds around that. And, uh, you know, me, I needed this for medicine, but it would just put me at odds with like my district, to, so to speak, to where it's like I, I kind of saw the hammer falling. I was already in Bitcoin at the time and just kind of like, OK, you need to move somewhere that's more tech oriented and more, you know, just going to allow you to use cannabis as medicine mainly. And um, yeah, but I mean, I'm glad I made that move because it does seem like these uh, these borders are coming in and it's like, uh, you know, the hammer can fall on entire groups of people i've got half of my family some some of my family's still in louisiana some of my family's in texas and it's like uh i don't know if they're necessarily gonna align and it's like uh, you know it definitely is like it's it's scary just seeing like where we are and where we're going and i can understand spears and not really un being able to read through the forest and the trees on this one just yet because we're still just we're in the thick of it man i would say we're in the weird and uh hopefully in a couple a few years and down the line of this and we can kind of iterate around it and things can start getting a lot better yeah and then like even within these regions like i'm from philly even like pennsylvania went for trump last direct not, not that i like talking about politics or anything just observationally pennsylvania went for trump and it was the deciding factor was bucks county which is just north of philadelphia it's like even within all right, we are back after my incompetent ISP disconnected me. Yeah, I think we were, uh, I was just talking about, we were talking about the balkanization of the United States in two particular regions, depending on uh, where you're located. But I, I was saying, like, even uh, where I'm from, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, like, Pennsylvania went, right? Again, I don't like to talk about politics, but just observationally, Pennsylvania went for Trump. Uh, last election, and, and it did that because of Bucks County, which is just north of Philadelphia. And where I am right now in New Jersey is a Second Amendment sanctuary county. And if you were to go a few counties north, you, you'd run into a bunch of liberal Democrats who have very different uh, ideas of how the world should work than the people that make up the county that I'm in right now. So like, even within these subregions, you have a very diverse uh, types of thought depending on what county you're in, not even the state.
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's where I was saying that, uh, yeah, there's that, like there's areas of Louisiana, they just call it the Arquitex or Texarkana because it's not Absolutely. actually like, it's you know, you know, people are kind of in the middle. It's definitely it's de- something that once the slope starts, we, you start to slide down the slope, like there is an incentive to, to just keep sliding a long ways. Yeah. Should I, I don't know. I'm new to mumble. I don't see the record button next to your name. Is that... Uh... Oh, it's I, I've, on his, I've got uh, it running on the the other uh, account I hopped on with. Oh, boss. Yeah, that's weird. Like, do you, like are we? Is this like another like tremor where this stuff sort of comes to the surface? Like I was mentioning, the the West Coast, Northern California, Oregon, Washington region, been talked about in the past as breaking off, and maybe Texas. Um, do you think it actually like something actually happens this time around, or is it like another tremor where this stuff sort of rises to the conversation and then? sort of goes back to the underbelly of, of weird conversations on the internet. I think it'll be a, a seismic event. Um, I think it, it's like really like if you look at this country, I think what it's going to do um, or what Bitcoin is going to do to it, like this, this balkanization, this localization, that was a trend well in motion before Bitcoin was even a twinkling in Satoshi's eyes. And it's just going to accelerate that. And it's like, just look at the, the, the cannabis legalization all across this country. Every state that legalizes cannabis is pretty much looking at the federal government and going, go fuck yourself. How does that play when you have frameworks for cooperation in, with coalitions of different states? Yeah. I mean, you, you gotta have a complete mental rewiring of like the way people view the world, right? Like, like who do you focus on? Like people our age or do you like, do I tell my son growing up like, hey, I grew up a certain way that the world does not work that way anymore. Like are people gonna be able to come to grips with that? And how does the world look in that, in that scenario? It's, it's, I mean, again, you live in the, we live in very interesting times. I think the younger you are, the more you'll just roll with it. And the older you are, the more it will just be cognitively disruptive to how you see the world. Yeah. And I'd say the next couple of months are going to be pretty pivotal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, something's got to give. And that's the other thing. Safety has been making this point too. Online, like we've disrupted the economy to such a point. And like the powers that be, the academics making decisions and the lockdown and stuff, that they don't realize that the economy is a very complex organism. It's not something you can just turn on and off. Like so, it's not like one day you're like, all right, everybody go back to work and things go back to normal. Like there is some things that are irreparably damaged from this stuff. Dude, it's funny you say that because I literally just had an argument with an idiot yesterday about how you can totally do that and what's the big deal. Yeah, a complex organism. Like, and that's why, thank God, we have Bitcoin because it gives us the ability to like fight against that top-down nature that tries to sort of dictate how this complex complex organism works to micromanage it. It's just like, no, I think that's why things are as dire as they are right now. We've had decades of trying to micromanage these complex systems, and all it took was one virus to sort of blow it all down. It was so weak. But yeah, that's where, I mean, it seems really robust. and short. Yeah, it's just this virus really just showed all the weaknesses. And yeah, I think it'll definitely be a then and now. Like, uh, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's hard to say like when and the timing of it. But I mean, yeah, if they don't, if they like put open the doors to businesses again and they don't see the rallying and the, and the, you know, the physical distancing doesn't actually work and like people are getting reinfected and like realizations that we're in a, in a cold war with China and we're re- about re- doing supply chains. Like if that stuff does start, start to roll, roll in, in, then yeah, yeah it's, it's going to be, be an hard. Well, then even taking it further, like we continue down the path of UBI too. I saw somebody float that we should just give every American $10,000 right now. Like that's uh, like... It's like the weird part. Like I do think the people who are being forced to work from home should be support. Like it's fucking disgusting that all these corporations are taking advantage of the small business loans and they're getting 
money and they're getting in the people who took undue risk in the financial markets are getting backed by the fed and they're getting bailed out but like we're finding ourselves in a very similar like people are like hyperinflation will never happen to the u.s dollar and everybody's saying that it's particularly right now and i like just the contrarian is like yeah i don't know man uh, specifically because we're in a very similar si- situation that the Weimar, uh the german uh germany was in the early 1920s where the like i would argue that we have had inflation here in the states for quite some time it's pretty obvious that the dollar's been debased. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty obvious that the dollar's been debased people people will argue like look at the cpi it's not true but it's fucking true um but uh, germany had the same thing during world war one where they took themselves off the gold standard to print money to go to war thinking that they would win and we're not in the same exact situation. We're we're in a very similar situation that when Germany lost World War One and all the countries came back to basically get reparations for the damage that Germany wrought, wrought during World War One, you had all these countries trying to. They said Germ- number one. They said Germany, you can't pay in your own currency. You have to get foreign currency and pay us, and that. that's all we'll accept. And then when they started slowing down on payments, France went to Germany to like basically make sure that they were getting their payments by siphoning off profits from the local businesses and germany at that point told the local businesses and the people that worked at them not to operate and that they would print money and just give it to the citizens and that's how they would subsist and that's what led to their hyperinflation it's not exactly the same as right now but we're doing a very similar thing we're telling people to stay home from work Uh, you don't have economic goods being produced so at the end of the day, and, the, and we want to print money in the form of UBI to dump it on people so they can live. And if we're not producing that stuff on the back end of that supply chain, you have a bunch, a shit ton more money uh, competing for even scarcer amount of good. Yep. And it, it's, it really is. Like, I mean, like, frankly, Marty, I think what happened is China um knew instantly what this was because it was something they were studying in a lab because that's what those labs are for um and they tried to hide it couldn't and so guaranteed that it spread everywhere so that it became the world's problem and i think knowing what it was you know we very well might be seeing that step down mutation to something relatively harmless like i said when uh we first started and it's like this is something they would know and i think we, like pretty much the entire world got played so that china didn't just eat shit and get fucked by themselves and they could try to spin it to their advantage instead no, totally. I mean, and you see that playing out. Like now, they're at first they weren't telling anybody what the hell is going on, and then uh, it's, it spread throughout the world. Now they're trying to play like big helper. Like, hey, we'll come in, we'll give you this PPE, we'll give you ventilators, we'll help you economically. Which, in all aspects, like the PPE and the test, have proved to be bunk. And then economically, like, how are they going to help economically when they're fucking? Like we think it's the dollar is bad here in America, the banking system's bad here in America, and finance is bad here in America. It's on fucking steroids in China. Like there's no value behind their banking system. They created ghost cities and just they're creating fake economic activity. And if you think we've fudged the numbers here, like it's taken to an extreme in China. Oh yeah, and on that that fake equipment thing, um I personally think it's 50-50 that that's intentional or that for every time that happens, um, some scammy um, entrepreneur who doesn't care about lying to people gets executed for making China look bad. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good point. But, yeah. Like, it's, it's... What? It's so weird. Like, do we... Because, I mean, there's videos going around from, like, a couple of years ago of, like, a Chinese military director saying that they are working on bioweapons. Like, should we get into the tinfoil stuff here? Like, do you think it was just leaked from that virology center? Was it truly uh, a bat to uh, human transmission? Was it the U.S. planning something there? Like, is this all just a huge psyop? It's fucked. Right. 
here's what I think. Happened. I'll let Shino, Shino take, take this. this. I think that there was obviously a leak from a lab. Um, and everything I put together just makes it seem like a hot spot of a variety of strains and bats far away from Wuhan was isolated and sampled by the lab. And one of the things that those labs are for is gain of function research, where you, you kind of just instigate mutations to see how a virus could mutate. And now whether that was part of a bioweapons thing or part of a vaccine program, um, who knows? It doesn't really matter. Um, it got out. They knew what they were dealing with, which is why they reacted so seriously and clamped down so hard. And when they realized it was bad enough that they were, they were fucked, they had to shut their economy down, fuck themselves. Um, they ensured that it spread everywhere so that they weren't the only ones negatively affected. And then put this whole strategy together of suck up all the PPE equipment and materials and then try to, to spin it like they're the savior because they fucked up and if they didn't do that then china, then china is, the is the only one only that's one. fucked yeah then you like you get into the i i mean i i think that's very very plausible um and something i would probably trend to agree with uh, and then you add into like the whole influence over the world health organization um and other international goliath like institutions that for some reason humans have decided to to take a uh, direction from uh and i mean the, the world health organization specifically has overtly been covering phase for china i mean that whole interview with the taiwanese reporter uh like, that was one of the dumbest things they could have ever done the world health organization specifically mm -hmm. oh my god that was so unbelievable just like just hang up click also, Marty, I think I've just made my, my peace with the fact that this, is, this the is the episode yep. that's going to get us kicked off of YouTube. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, well, Susan was shaky if we're, if we're whatever her fucking name is. If we're, not, if we're not in line with what the World Health Organization is saying, then yes, we will probably be kicked off. We are misinformation. We have bad think. Oh, well. Uh, uh, yeah. You've been kind of quiet for a bit, but you have anything, anything you want to get into? Oh no. Did the cats go crazy and kill Janine? No. I think she's feeding. Ah. Well, I mean, did, did you want to, I don't know, touch on touch anything, on anything in, this in this brave world? world? Uh, well, the only, the, the one thing that I've been worried about for the most part is um, obviously part of the most vulnerable population are people who are stuck in prison, not only because they're forced to be in close quarters with other people, but because being in prison is not exactly an environment uh, for maintaining health. It's the opposite. So the situation in the UK is going to be particularly interesting because Assange at this point is still uh, has still not been released, even though there are calls all over the UK, including in The Guardian, about how prison conditions um, make people more susceptible to this, how there are already prisoners and staff who are infected, and in fact some prisoners who have died already from coronavirus. And there's calls to release not at least nonviolent prisoners who would be, you know, no threat to society. And so far there has only been one hearing. It was last I think it was actually earlier this month, um, where Assange's lawyers asked for um for him to be released and the judge at that point said that uh, the you know general guidance of the prison didn't suggest that that would be necessary, and you know he's not the only vulnerable prisoner, and blah blah blah. Um, so hopefully that you know hopefully that um, hopefully she's changed her mind because 
you know, the more time passes, the more prisoners are likely to get infected. And whether it's just prison unrest or the virus, is, the virus itself, the longer that he's in, in there, the more at risk he is of something happening. And the idea that they should deny him, you know, a situation where he'd been under house arrest when, you know, no, there's no flights or barely any flights. Um, there's a lot of border control. There's a lot of police wandering the streets, checking people. Um, like the idea that it would be easy for him to leave is preposterous. And, but even then, even if it was a risk, risk that, that he, he could, could, that he could, you know, the, that he would be a flight risk, um, he's still a prisoner on remand. He hasn't, hasn't been, been convicted. convicted. So it makes no sense to basically give someone a death sentence when they haven't been convicted and they're a nonviolent offender or are charged as a nonviolent offender. It makes no sense. Well, I mean, it comes down to how hard you can twist their arm with public pressure. Yeah, that's just like one of the most aspects of this where it's like people want to get tinfoil hat about I've, you know, everybody. everybody talks about, well, these people are getting taken out. And that's just like, man, this is like, it's scary that, uh, you know, he's in that situation. And it is like all this unaccountable stuff going on. And, you know, that guy is really at risk. And it's one of those things where, I mean, like Julian, he stands, for, you know, there is journalism out there still. And it's just like if that, like, I, I worry. I really, really worry. Yeah, I mean, I, I. For Julian's, I mean, they they Chelsea Manning them, right? They 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 cooped them up in that Ecuador embassy for years, no sunlight, and I I find it hard to believe that his mind is anywhere near as sharp as it would have been if he was able to roam free as a journalist uh, like years ago. And that's the the most the saddest thing about this whole situation is that we we've probably lost, if we're being honest with ourselves, one of the great journalists of our time, just via the state cooping him up in that that embassy for years and now um probably torturing him if we're being honest with ourselves well luckily um i mean chelsea got released and actually she, uh, she hasn't said very much since then but she has posted one photo um that she's apparently been i don't know what what city she's in currently but she's going around um distributing ppe actually um that's the only thing i've heard from her publicly so she's fine um but then there's also a reality winner who has also applied to be released and she has been denied so far yeah they're free now but how much did their did their uh like being being subjected to the conditions they were really fuck with their minds and their their ability to uh be as good as what they were doing uh, had they not been put in jail yeah, it's, that's where I worry about some of that long arm authoritarianism that, you know, and some of the stuff that we've seen over the past couple of decades. And uh, like we're talking about these blocks and uh. it's what happens when the government decides they don't care about the rules anymore. Yeah, this whole system. Habeas. Uh, this is where it's like, yeah, we just absolutely have to implement a real sound money nice. solution that's going to freaking create real regional economies within this country that are you know, not all built off of just uh, quantitative BS. Yeah, like it, I'm three beers deep now, three Coronas deep, and now I'm starting to get all riled up and pissed off. Like, it's fuck. Like, again, like there's such, that's such a small amount of the humans on Earth. So few people make all these decisions, and they're all fucking assholes. Like, what did Julian Assange and uh, Chelsea Manning together, what are they... What do they basically prove? It's the, the military. And again, I don't blame the individual soldiers who were part of that video where they were shooting journalists. I, I bet they honestly thought they, they were um, killing enemies or harming enemies. But like they shouldn't have been in that position in the first place. Like, Why the fuck were we over there? Yes. That's a, uh, that's a big one. But then they went and upset the liberal darlings instead of just towing the line. Well, I mean, like, this is really, like, I mean, we're talking about really expansion for 
source material and, uh, you know, how exactly to best monetize that and uh, use that for, like, I guess, well, the way it has been in macroeconomic markets is for nation state building and for empire running. But like what we're talking about and like what, you know, you yeah. guys are doing with Great American Mining is like you're taking this and like totally revamping it with something new. This tech that hasn't been here. Yeah. yeah. We can, yeah, we can transition to more optimistic conversations now. I mean, yeah, I, I think what we're doing at Great American Mining really provides an opportunity to bring back like ruthless capitalism to America, particularly and, and the world in general. Um, I think we have a very unique situation that has actually been surprising to me that the first 11 years of Bitcoin's existence hasn't been taken more advantage of. So, Shinobi Autism Activate. <laughs> activate. I think he's been interested to talk about this subject for a while. Let's rip it. So, I think that the entire flare mining and natural gas as a source can do some amazing things in terms of reorganizing the mining ecosystem incentive wise to be more modular mobile and potentially because of that more censorship resistant but i think that there are some really interesting dynamics that come into the picture if flare well or like flare wells like that are used to power a significant percentage of bitcoin miners what I agree with your first statement. What are your concerns in the second half of that statement? So, you know, w walk through me with this and just think about the, the nature of a gas well when you first tap it in terms of the excess, um, you know, gas that will put off versus what can actually be captured or put in a pipeline which creates this whole opportunity and just that diminishing curve. And just think about what happens entirely dependent on how many new wells get started in a year or how saturated that is in terms of a new well means a massive spike in hash rate. And then as that well's production capacity diminishes, that hash rate starts dropping off. So it creates this dynamic where a new well being tapped or new, like the rate of new wells incentivizes massive spikes in difficulty, but then naturally because of the diminishing returns involved, you know, a, a taper off on the other side of that. That's predictable if there are not new wells being tapped in, in sync with that. I mean, I think it's a, a very good point to make and so let's dive into it for you punks that aren't aware like when you poke a hole in the earth to bring oil out uh when you first poke that hole it's going to produce a lot more oil uh, in the first 12 to 18 months than it will for the rest of its life cycle which depending on where you are could last anywhere from a couple years to a decade um so you're talking about being able to consume like 100 megawatts of energy uh, on site for a year to 18 months uh, down to something like closer to like 10 to 15. Uh, but I think Shinobi have to take into consideration like, like the, the supply chain of the hardware. Like even if you wanted to poke all these holes in the earth and consume all the gas coming out uh, at the time that they're poked, like you'd have to have that hardware lined up in the background uh ready to go so i think it would be much more controlled than you're envisioning where yeah you poke a hole and you, you get to consume a lot more gas for the first uh for for a good amount of time and uh, eventually uh the the amount of gas coming from that operation depletes to a much lower level but i think so we think that mining is going to become very ingratiated in these processes throughout time and there will be uh, somewhat of like a, a staggering uh, of the production of the well heads, uh, the well pads, excuse me, uh, based on how much energy consumed with the mining as well. Well, see, I think that 
you know, given the the economics here, there's a lot more wiggle room with a, a gas miner like this to use less efficient hardware and i mean frankly like half of the the asic manufacturers out there are sitting on fuck tons of older hardware and i think it's, it's like ultimately we're already part way through that that hardware is commoditizing phase and on the other end of that like those chips are just a thing that you can't really make much better that costs pennies a chip yeah, no, it's definitely uh, happening. Like S nines are being consumed by people with the lowest forms of energy. But then you have to think about the incentives of the company doing the mining, right? We want to mine as much Bitcoin as possible, and the way to best do that is to mine with the best machines at any given point in time, uh, at the lowest energy cost pro- possible, energy and capex and opex cost possible. Uh, so I think you'll see a mixture, or you'll have some of the best hardware uh you'll have a mix of the top of the line hardware and the older hardware sort of moving in concert across these well pads as they're being produced and then another thing to take into consideration too which steve barber has actually been bringing up a lot lately is that the misallocation of capital that's been enabled by the fiat monetary system and, and the fed uh allowing these oil and gas companies to get loans they may not otherwise be able to get with a sound monetary system has sort of produced more oil production than uh, would have otherwise happened had we been in the sound monetary regime. So you got to also factor in that change if we do really start getting towards like a Bitcoin standard in the future that the, the production of new well pads will be more conservative than it has been up to this point. Yeah, fair enough. But it's it's, it's still like, it, it, like I'm not saying like it's gonna break Bitcoin or something. I'm just saying like it's think through like the the picture that paints. It, it introduces a kind of volatility um, uh, incentive to the difficulty unless you have that whole market, that whole kind, market of get kind of get captured um, more by like a a scaled down miner that just migrates frequently rather than rather. just all the wells saturating. Well, that's what we had, right? That's, that's the beauty of what we're doing at great American mining is like, we're making these containers as portable as possible. So as soon as that, um, that demand for the flare, the, what have otherwise would be flared gas consumption reduces due to the, the, uh, life cycle of the pad, we just move to another one and we can have, yes, we may shut it down on one pad one day, but the vision is we'll be able to move that within a couple of days and turn them on on another pad that needs them as well. So if it, I don't think it's going to be a sustained uh, disruption to hash power. And then on top of that, like, like you said, you think it's going to lead to a mass distribution uh, of hash rate across these oil fields. So you have the back in the Permian, you have many oil fields here in America alone in north america and then between them you have hundreds of companies from very small family-owned oil fields to large conglomerates like exxon there's no way to time like they don't time the the them poking holes in the earth to take the oil out like so you're gonna have yes one may be poking a hole uh in the earth at one point but another maybe like halfway through their life cycle and so i think you'd also see like a natural sort of leveling out because you do have that competition between uh oil producers that you can't really time that stuff they're not doing it in concert there well see and this is another you know i'm, I'm kind of working towards like you know getting into the difference of like a third party kind of buying off this capacity um because it makes sense for the oil producer versus uh, the producer themselves mining but it's like an interesting price dynamic with like the the like the incentive, like the incentive, to, do incentive this, to do this is as long is as, as you long- make more money um mining bitcoin than you would just selling that gas if you have the pipeline access to do so then um you know you you, you mine the bitcoin and then the kind of the maximum any kind of oil producer could really charge a third party miner for that 
is like up to their cheapest alternative energy source they could practically relocate to. And so there's kind of like that that weird sweet spot um window. And it's it's really my thinking is why wouldn't until the difficulty really narrows that to a margin a gas producer you know not want to just do them themselves and capture as much of that premium as possible but then on the flip side they're an oil company like unless they are ideologically motivated as a bitcoiner that is 100% dumped to fiat as it comes in because they are dollar denominated dollar denominated obligations dollar denominated revenue and like it's my my thinking is is not entirely like oh my god bitcoin will crash to the ground there it's just like that would add a a kind of extra load to what is guaranteed getting dumped onto the market constantly and more importantly is those miners aren't really entirely aligned incentive wise with bitcoin beyond their making dollar revenue with that and so it's kind of the the risks there potentially if this this space jumps from bitcoiners seeking this out as an energy source to these utilities just doing it themselves yeah and that's where i think you have to dive into like the nature of these oil fields and how they actually operate like outside of the oil extraction and selling it like they try to do the least amount as possible as they have to on site. So they contract out a lot of the services that they need to happen outside of the oil extraction on the field. So that's the way at Great American Mining, we we envision ourselves just becoming a contractor uh, that the oil and gas uh, producers have an option to take advantage of to do flare mitigation. And we as a company are Bitcoin focused. Like we are just going to sell what we need to to cover our expenses and then hold as much bitcoin as possible and accumulate as much bitcoin as possible um as a contractor on site like all the oil companies care about is is like you said is producing oil and the way we allow them to to keep doing that is by consuming as much of their waste gas as possible so that they don't hit emissions levels that that stop them from producing oil and then on top of that, another thing you have to take into consideration when the opportunity cost of selling gas into a pipeline or consuming it on site, like one thing you have to consider is the quality of the gas. Like most of the gas that we're consuming is not uh, not like pipeline quality gas. It's what's considered dirty gas. And the fact that we're able to help them, one, uh, avoid the the flare emissions that come with just flaring that gas and two actually turn that dirty gas which would otherwise go for practically nothing on the market into something of economic value uh is really beneficial in the long term and then um i think you'd be surprised at how 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 much the ethos of the oil and gas industry aligns with bitcoin and how how open-minded some of these oil and gas producers will be to bitcoin in the future I mean, I hope so, because it's just like one of my big concerns is I think inevitably power producers will become major miners just because it's a way to finance and speed up ROI on new production capacity without having to build the pipeline, pipeline. without having to build the the, the grid infrastructure to to dump it into the grid first. And I just kind of worry about the incentive incentive potential for that kind of major efficiency in just a normal business and how much of of the the mining share that eats up because that really is like unless bitcoin really exploding in growth and monetizing coincides with that like how could that go wrong how could so what do i have to answer how could it go wrong well, I'm not. I'm just kind of like thinking out loud here because it's it's like really the dis. And th- this is why I said when when we first got into the the mining side of the the show today, 
it comes down to the incentive alignment and this being a double-edged sword like on the one side this is incentivizing the production of hardware and a facility setup that is very mobile and modular and that is a huge plus but on the other side it's kind of paving the road to that realization by these players now and so is is that road getting paved and that insight being realized prematurely to where bitcoin is really going to tear off and, and become a serious monetized thing i don't think so because again think of the long-term incentives like coin solves a problem for these oil and gas companies that is massive and is a, a massive problem that they need to solve quickly and the alternatives to bringing containers filled with miners on site uh, to consume the gas are pretty shit right now and they're way more expensive and they're they're not as effective like we have experienced 97 and a half percent uptime with our containers on the oil fields that we're on so we're able to consume gas pretty much continuously which is unheard of at this point and so if you're thinking of it like ah oh, the oil companies are getting into mining and they're going to dump dump and just like suppress bitcoin well wouldn't that kill the golden goose that allows them to keep that oil production up right so thinking from a game theory perspective like they have incentives to hold Bitcoin and, and make sure Bitcoin has uh, value in it so that they can actually you know, mitigate the flare that they, or the, the waste of gas that they need to. Yeah, but Bitcoin's pretty financialized. You can, you can handle that slippage on a futures contract. Like, and, and also, like you're an oil company. Um, if, if the government goes, miners have to dot, 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 those oil companies have a crazy incentive to make sure any mining happening on any of their facilities is doing dot, dot, dot. Hmm. I mean, just anecdotally too, you'd be surprised at like how many of the dot, dot, dot mandates that are out there now that the oil companies are not, are not following, particularly around like uh, reporting how many emissions they have and how much they're truly flaring or venting. Um, yeah, no, it's an unknown uh, at this point. Like it's so raw, it's so new. Uh, I can't give any certainty with what will play out in the future, but I just do think this incentives align. Um, and I think the oil gas industry has actually one of the more uh, a greater ability to stand up to the government than, than other industries. Um, it's throughout the U.S. particularly, just because of the the benefit they provide from an energy energy independence uh, standpoint. Yeah, it just makes me kind of hesitant when big power shifts happen. But you know, on on the on the positive side, though, it it is creating that type of of modularity. And you know, I, I actually went and re-listened to the the tales from the crypt uh, you did on Great American Mining uh yesterday just to have it all fresh but the the thing i like about that modularity incentive is that it's it's just purely profit motivated like cheap bare bones plug and play get it done yeah and i think we were talking about like the breaking up of, of the us and the regions earlier. i mean we already see that in regulation like we're in north dakota because they have stricter regulations in texas like oil producers in texas like look at us and like why aren't you buying gas from the company you're working with like we would just try to sell you that gas and due to the regulatory environment in north dakota specifically like they don't care about selling the gas like just help us get fucking rid of it in an environmentally friendly way a friendlier way and we'll give it to you um so like even today you don't have concise sort of regulations across the united states about this stuff so i don't i think uh it would be I, i'm more optimistic that that like sort of broad brush uh regulation would, would ever come to fruition especially with the balkanization that we were describing earlier starting to come to play mm -hmm. i'm just talking like more like the actual like technical like modular setup 
because I mean, you know, when I when I look at these cargo container things, I mean, they're they're modular. You can just you know minus environmental tweakings to the setup, plug them into a generic power source. You can put them on a truck, on a train, and like ultimately the the design rationale for the interior setup is something that could be replicated probably in all kinds of other things besides you know cargo containers. And it's just that that the fact that the natural incentives are actually shaping these mining operations, like make modular mobile things that can move as they need to, is just a beautiful thing. Because that is exactly what the fuck miners need in, in terms of surviving a fluid situation. That that's shifting constantly. Like you need to be able to just pick up and move your operation if prices change somewhere, or regulations change somewhere, or just the attitude changes somewhere. And you know that that's already something that was kind of happening to some degree in different areas. But you know, this is a power source. Natural gas just incentivizes taking that to a whole new level. Yeah, no, that's like, luckily we have Austin Storms on our team and he notices early on getting, a lot of people are obviously building huge data centers behind grids and we notice that in Quebec and other areas that they can put a bunch of sunk cost into these operations. They, like Your power provider can just be like, all right, we're going to jack the prices up but the government can be like, all right, you're consuming too much energy even though nobody else is, we don't like you so we're going to tax you more. And that puts them in a very precarious situation. Where we are in the oil fields, again, like talking about its incentives aligning, like the incentives are just fucking much more pure and they make a lot more sense where it's wasted energy. That's what Bitcoin mining trends towards is that wasted energy, all right? Where are people like just wasting energy? Let's go there and consume it. And up till about a month ago, the oil companies were making enough money uh with the oil alone they didn't even care about the waste gas and now they're thinking of the waste gas as even an alternative revenue stream um that they wouldn't have thought about otherwise and again it's geographically distributed there's uh it's across jurisdictional boundaries more importantly as well across north america from mexico all the way up to canada and so you get you have i think much more uh decentralization if you're if you're attacking the like think about trying to attack a centralized uh a centralized uh like warehouse compared to many disparate uh, containers throughout deserts like if you want to emp a lot of the network right now that's in warehouses it'd be considerably easier than going to emp each individual container spread across hundreds of miles in oil fields yeah, it just it, it just worries me. I don't know. See, I, I, I love that side of things because you can just kind of pull them off, move them, and plug them into whatever minus some situational tweaking. But it's it just it, it really worries me whether what? these companies see more financial opportunity out of games they can play because of how financialized Bitcoin is getting versus like actually encouraging and helping the monetization of Bitcoin. And again, it's geographically distributed and then it's like company to company distributed too. It's not like one oil, oil and gas producer is going to, uh, to control all the mining off of waste gas. Like there's hundreds of companies. And as we're finding out with this oil crisis right now, some of them are in very precarious situations. So you, you have different incentives between these companies as well to not play games. Um, and, and I think, it, again, their main focus is oil. Maybe it changes in the future, but having them all coordinate together to fuck over Bitcoin um, and play with Bitcoin seems seems like a very arduous task but who knows maybe maybe it develops that way it is something to definitely think of well if it does we'll get a lot of logistical knowledge out of setups that are beneficial to bitcoiners 
as in real Bitcoiners. And uh, we'll learn a lot from a new attack vector. But either yeah, way, I, I'd, I'd rather have the hardware somewhere in North America than over in China. I agree. And I, I mean, obviously it's early days in this stuff too, but I do believe the people involved with this, us, I mean, we're definitely, we're, we're Bitcoiners. We're in this number one, number one to profit. We think it's a profitable business and we want to make money and more importantly, accumulate Bitcoin. But we also think it's, we, we want to accumulate Bitcoin and bring this to North America specifically because the, the owner of the company has been into Bitcoin for quite some time and he wants to make sure that it succeeds. And then you look at the other players in this particular niche in the mining world. You have Steve Barber. He seems to be pretty ideologically uh, drawn to Bitcoin and, and others. And if you go to the Bitcoin oil and gas um, chat on Telegram, like there's there's a bunch of smaller miners using waste gas that nobody knows about that are just like for the Bitcoin cause as well. And we, I mean, I had a call earlier today with somebody from one of the largest oil companies in the world, not even the US, who's a Bitcoiner and is trying to figure this out too. So I think we talk about... Uh, Fifth pillar or fifth column? I always get yelled at for this. Fifth column. Fifth column. Fifth column. I think there's more fifth column actors in the ONG industry than, than many would realize. Well, that's a, a good sign because, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much my only real fucking concern with that is just like I, I look at shifts in the mining ecosystem and they make me hold my breath. Because I just see superpowers dominating that unless they are pretty much eroded and crippled by the time things really start taking hold. And when I see shifts in that, I just immediately start thinking, where are their inroads? Yeah, well, that's the beauty again. Like, why I think Bitcoin or is an oil and gas sort of align very well is like oil and gas is still very much ruthless capitalism that's like the line that austin likes to use for bitcoin mining it's ruthless capitalism oil and gas is the same way and another benefit we have here is like the fucking government isn't paying attention to any of this shit yet like by the time we get set up and and integrated in the oil fields that we're working in it's gonna be too late for them to do anything we're gonna be able to turn around be like fuck you go away this works for us uh it's like you need as a government you need america to be oil and energy independent and bitcoin is helping us do that like don't fuck up something that's working and by the time they notice unless they come on this stuff pretty quickly i think it may be too late right on man i mean i really gotta applaud the efforts because like you're saying i mean it's just raw capitalism and uh mining and and energy is like a uh, zero-sum game here and like even though these things might be drawn up on different borders or districts the fact of the matter is like if we're making energy more renewable did Rick just cut out or did I? Uh, you know, you know, I understand your, you know, your sentiment on that, but it, it is like with Bitcoin and all this development, it all kind of just goes at once. And uh, I mean, it, it's in a direction that we need and um, it's a direction that the country needs as far as just like jobs, economic activity, continued development and technology and new jobs with, uh, you know, trying to build out the renewable infrastructure. Yeah. And like to take it even further, like, I like I take it like a 30 year view on this. I think there's an order of operations. Like we have the coin centers and now that fucking hodl pack, whatever it's called, uh, like trying to create lobby groups on behalf of Bitcoin and quote unquote cryptocurrencies uh, on Capitol Hill. And again, I, I think it's safe to assume that most of us in this chat right now are libertarians who really don't uh, want to have to go through the state to make this stuff happen. But if we do want an ally on Capitol Hill and we don't want to sort of create a lobby group ourselves, like the oil and gas industry already has a lot of pull there. And so my thought is from an order of operations standpoint, is like, all right, we get on these oil fields, we sort of Trojan horse ourselves in like, all right, we're going to help you with your flare problem. We will help you reduce your flare. And basically allude, like, yeah, we're going to do it via Bitcoin mining. And they're like, ah, oh, whatever. As long as you're reducing our flare, we don't care. We just need it reduced. Help us reduce it. And then what we're doing at GAM is just being very transparent with the oil company we're working with. Like, hey, look at how much gas we consumed. Look at how much Bitcoin we mined. Look at how much money we made. 
uh, ourselves just from doing this for you without you even paying as much. And then they're like, then they get their interest peaked. Like, okay, maybe we should throw money at this contractor to help them build out this flare mitigation service on our oil fields. And then, all right, you get your infrastructure, you get an investment in your infrastructure on your field to such a point where it's like, all right, this is a pretty big investment in infrastructure that we made now. We got to make sure that this investment doesn't get bricked overnight. So if Washington tries to shut down Bitcoin, we're going to stand up with our lobbying power and tell you to go fuck yourself. And then after that point, it's like, all right, we've we've we got the okay here. We've got all this infrastructure built. Let's look at the supply chain that's enabling this infrastructure. It seems concentrated in this one part of the world. Maybe we should invest in bringing some of that supply chain over here as well. Well, I hope the play works because uh, anything is better than Coin Center, who spends all their time lobbying bureaucrats who can't change any rules instead of congress who can and gets fun results like oh everybody owes taxes on fork drops yeah jeez it's just yeah it's great also like that it's just like sort of moving into different economic i mean like it's oil and gas but at the same time like you're saying the supply chain is also like uh you know power stations and electrical engineers and people that are working in those departments and they see it as a, you know, I mean, we we have a regular electrical engineer here in the Bitcoin mobile named Blockbang, and he's always talking about trying to create efficiency gains for the grid as a whole. And this sort of thing can help uh, sort of flatten peak energy hours that they're just burning energy at these uh, peak centers. And uh, there's like these, uh, this whole economy there just in energy. And, uh, you know, this would, you know, modernize it. Yeah, I mean... Again, we we like to say Bitcoin fixes this a lot, but it really does. Like, you, I don't even know if I mean I doubt Satoshi even foresaw the types of efficiencies Bitcoin would make outside of just money alone. Like it is ingratiating itself in every industry and every nook and cranny of our lives, and it, and it will continue to do that going forward. And I mean, we're all Bitcoin bulls here, but I do honestly believe it's got it like bring in a new enlightenment and renaissance that like which we've we've never seen before and in terms of like coin center and all those guys like fighting for like all coins like zcash all that bullshit like the oil and gas companies they, they like to keep it simple and, and they're they don't care about anything else uh except for bitcoin and it doesn't actually make sense to do anything else except for bitcoin on these oil fields because main, many of them are GPU mining or they're ASICs that are getting forked, uh, ASIC uh, scripts that are getting forked every once in a while. Um, and just the, the logistics of changing out that hardware uh, in, a, in a disparate oil field don't make any sense. So like actually like SHA-256 ASIC mining is perfect for their setup where they just have to do as little as possible. Wait, what, Marty? Are you telling me that a, a multi-billion-dollar industry wouldn't want to open themselves up to whimsical nerds' choices as far as whether their business lives or dies? <laughs> it is well. That's another thing I've been talking uh, about more in private with people, especially people who, like try to like show me Ethereum. Like it's the next thing. I'm like, dude, like once this once this hit a certain scale and there's so much sunk cost in this like the opportunity cost that ex that exists and will exist at that level like you can't fuck around you can't be invest like why would anybody invest in uh eth asics or gpus to put in an oil field right now and they're saying they're going to go to proof of stake like it's just not going to happen they're not going to have that infrastructure investment at all or anywhere close to it like big like right now we had a 200 billion dollar market cap for all cryptocurrencies you can play these these games and then think that this stuff is going to happen. But once you hit a certain scale from an infrastructure investment standpoint, like they don't play games anymore. The opportunity cost gets too high. Mm -hmm. Right I, on. I've you know, seen... like sorry, oh, it's, sorry. It's it's you know, Marty. I I really hope, and I I think there's you know more likely than not you're right about all of this because this would be like the perfect boom 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 win in terms of bitcoin stability it would get massive at scale energy producers aligned in incentives with bitcoin distribute the mining physically all over the place 
and actually gives some leverage in DC. And it's just like, I don't know. I, I don't know why. Like every every bit of my, my rational cerebellum is saying, you're right, Marty, but the, the drunk shinobi hindbrained is screaming it's a trap. And I, I don't know why. No, I, uh, I, no, I, I am question, constantly questioning it too. Like it sounds too good to be true. So I'm always looking for areas in which we could be wrong. So always never feel shy about <laughs> highlighting those areas or, or bringing up your concerns because I want to know them too. Right on. And yeah, those opportunity costs with those other, yeah, yeah. it's like crazy how like uh, I've been doing the crypto and Bitcoin thing now or the Bitcoin and cannabis thing. And it's like, I'm sorry, I just like, it's like crypto has worked its way into the narrative so much to where like the minute I start talking, it's like, okay, well, you, you know, what about all this crypto? It's like, no, wait, no, this is very simple. We're just talking about Bitcoin and cannabis and that's it. Yeah, there's not enough time on the planet or in, in life on the planet. Is there time on the planet? Not enough time in one's life to like at some point you have to realize like, all right, I mean, and that's the thing is every, every, every block just sort of cements Bitcoin as something that's going to be here into the future. As much as this VC funded crypto world would like to think otherwise, or I don't think they think otherwise would like noobs and retail investors to think otherwise. It's just, it's not going to happen. And again, going back to the infrastructure cost alone, like you're never like again, the opportunity cost is going to get too high. It's like, all right, why, why play in the B league? Why play in the C league? Why play in the D league? It's, it's not worth it. Well, I hope we, uh, we get your, your Renaissance, but, uh, I, I have a random question, rum fueled question. Am I going to have to lambast you for these things? Not using the block stream satellite feed. <laughs> We, we we actually might i mean right we're we are no don't lambast us because it, it's something we're definitely thinking about uh great american mining where we are right now i mean we're still young we're still a young company we've only been live on the oil field that we're on for the last five months and we've had a sort of uh, mvp like just get the bare minimum of what we need to get live to prove to this oil company that it's worthwhile live so we've uh we we, we will be uh, more ingratiated with the the higher tech Bitcoin stuff that that helps uh, decentralize the network even further beyond a beyond an infrastructure and geographical uh, standpoint. But right now, we just got to do what we can to convince these oil companies that hey, you should be fucking doing this. Well, like here, let, let me let me let me follow this up a little more a little more poking. Um, did, does the red tape involved with, uh, the, the actual site that GAM operates involve like bureaucratically red tape specifically going, we are mining Bitcoin at this location somewhere? No, no. I think in the, in the job order that we have, we're simply just like a data center that doesn't even mention Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. Well then, Mr. Marty. That little there block stream satellite dish and just a little efficient, you know, uplink to, to blast a compact block header would allow that to just sit there completely anonymously unless someone came knock knock and looked in the container um, and not give itself away as a Bitcoin miner. I will bring this up to Austin who and our, uh, and our, and our mechanical engineer team that does all this stuff. That's one thing we've like especially where we are like and that's we have to use satellite internet because of how like uh like these oil fields are in the middle of fucking nowhere so it may actually even make more sense to do that yeah that would probably save on any downlink costs and then um you know yeah you only have to deal with the the uploads for your box but um yeah i mean like they, dude if that's the situation then I think you just sold me, Marty. Um, this could gobble the oil industry alive before Washington sees anything but data center on a form anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm like 90%, 90 to 95% sure that we're just a data center and all the, the paperwork that we're on. Hell yeah, man. That's just awesome to hear. And like, uh, it's just where we started this conversation and where we're going. It's like, uh, it's crazy, crazy times where things are changing. But 
there's a lot of opportunity and uh there's also a lot of potential for a bright future there yeah man like yeah i'm happy that we ended it on the mining and didn't start the uh, the orwellian bullshit because it is positive man. i'm like I'm very positive when I think about the mining stuff. When I think about like what's going on with the shutdowns and how everything's getting encroached, our civil liberties are being encroached everywhere. It really brings me down. But then, like you think of this, actually, like, true capitalism and uh, building out this network in Bitcoin that can help us get away from that. It, it is infinitely optimistic, and I'm, I know I'm not going to say it because Matt always destroys the price when he says it. So I'm going I'm to withhold from saying it here on this podcast. Dude, I think people don't really grasp what Bitcoin mining is going to do in terms of the macroeconomic picture in the long term. Um, all I'm going to say is that, and I'm probably going to catch a bunch of shit on Twitter from this eventually, um, that John Nash... And you need to find somebody who can put the drink drink down down every once in a while or isn't crazy to apply John Nash to Bitcoin. What, the completely efficient monetary system? uh, What what was it? Nash's theory of money. What is... uh, Ideal money. money? Yeah, the ideal money. I mean, yeah, it is. I mean, when you get heady about it, like it is... I think about what we're turning into value, like wasted gas. Like it would have otherwise been wasted and just sent into the ether. We're turning that into hard digital money. Like the efficiency, I mean, I mean, efficiency is from that. In order of magnitude and a few decades. Think Bitcoin land. Think the whole economy's working on Bitcoin. Okay. Now think the business cycle. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get yelled at again, probably, but anybody who thinks the business cycle will disappear because sound money is a moron who doesn't understand that a new investment opportunity will draw capital until it saturates. And that happens no matter how shitty or good your money is. But, um, now imagine this, um, economic can- growth happens because of that. So Bitcoin activity picks up. So mining revenue picks up. So the incentive to mine picks up so more hash rate comes on and bids up the price of energy which is the base of pretty much all economic calculus which kind of checks that growth a little bit and smooths it out so instead of the boom and bust of a business cycle you just have a gradual smooth thing because mining in a purely bitcoin world literally self-regulates economic growth so that it is not exaggerated with a proportional crash on the other side. I just got to show me. <laughs> it's fucking, it's a, again, it all sounds too good to be true, but the incentives are fucking perfect. Like this is, if you play out to its logical conclusion, this is what happens. And no, like we're going to get away. And that's what I wrote about today. The paradox of thrift is dumb. And that stupid idea that Keynesians have thrown on us like is is clouded generations of people for for too long and now it's time to get back to a sound money standard bitcoin provides that opportunity and the the actual physics of how bitcoin works even drives the efficiencies that would be gained from a sound money system uh, that takes it to another level like you just described mm-hmm. it really let's play some other hard assets over there it really was aliens. <laughs> it might have been, dude. I, I'm, we don't know. We do not know. We never will. Dude, just think just, about that. Dude, like, holy shit. Okay. Like, just like, think just about think- that. Think about how fucking radically this world was shifted by some random asshole on the internet. No one will ever know. That's a thing. That's going to be in a history book somewhere. Yeah, dude. I mean, fuck. I, I have to get on a call in three minutes. I would love to dive down this. Can I come back in 30 minutes and talk about this? Yeah, yeah um, definitely, definitely fucking, fucking hop, hop, back, hop on. back on. Okay. Um, yeah, I got I to gotta hop on this call. But are you still doing that thing with uh, that you were describing yesterday in DMs? 
Uh, just just hop in and, and we'll we'll give a chat about it. But um, we'll 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 wrap the uh the special edition of Black Digest up here, and there will be some form of complimentary content uh to follow, punks. So uh, I hope you enjoyed <laughs> this. Uh, I'm gonna be really drunk soon. Yeah, I'm I'm three beers deep about to uh about to break the seal. So when I come back, I'll be even saucier. Thank you guys for having me. I mean. I've been a huge fan for years. The content you guys put out and the focus that you guys have on the subjects that you talk about has helped me understand Bitcoin and civil liberties better as an individual. So I thank you for everything you guys do. Yeah. Thank you too, Marty. Really appreciate what you and Matt are putting together over there. It's always some great content and, and I really appreciate it as well. Yeah, I mean, appreciate it. back at you. Yeah, we need to do a, a huge TFTC block digest uh collab at some point soon yeah we need yeah, a in party too yes yes fact i mean i've been it, waiting to say that and mumble seems like a, an even better place to record this stuff like, like this seemed pretty seamless like i don't like i usually like to like look, look at people via like video conference but this was not bad at all I need to be able to hide the fact that I'm autistically doing five other things and only devoting like a fraction of my attention to you. Otherwise, I look like an asshole. What the fuck, man? Um, that was that rude. Was... <laughs> All right, I got to jump here real quick, but I'll be back in here in like 30 minutes. All right, later, Marty. Deuces, guys. Thank you. Peace, punks. Bye. <laughs> Was there, was there, that's a good chance to